Well, good evening. As we get started, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pull those notes right out. I want to read something, and I want you to follow along right on the very top. We're going to talk as we close out our series on how to find God when you're troubled and depressed. Depression is as old as human history. The Bible has many examples of people struggling with despondency and despair. In his depression and fatigue, Elijah asked for his life to be taken. Jonah felt deeply despondent after God did not destroy Nineveh. Jeremiah regretted the day he was born. Job's wife advised him, curse God and die in the midst of his suffering and pain. Well-known church leaders like Martin Luther, uh, John Bunyan, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and J.B. Phillips struggle with depression on and off throughout their entire life. Uh, political leaders such as Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln, as you read their biographies, they struggled significantly with depression. Depression is no respecter of persons. It's been called the common cold of emotional disorders, and it appears in America to be on the rise. 20% of all Americans sometime in their life will be treated for a very significant case of depression, often requiring some level of hospitalization or medication. Uh, this is an interesting one when we talk about finding God in difficult times because this is one that has um, sometimes some taboo or... Um, especially among Christians, like if I really love God, if I'm spiritual, if I'm walking with God, I shouldn't get depressed. And so before we jump in, I have a little bit of extra background in this area. I'm going to walk through with you what depression is, what normal depression is. I'm going to give you some very quick uh, psychological factors, physical factors. I'll define very carefully for you what clinical depression is. You need to know the difference between that and what I call normal depression. And actually, there's even spiritual reasons. So I want you to lean back, and all I want to do is give you a sort of a quick overview of this topic of depression. And then as we get into Psalm 77, all of us have, quote, the common emotional cold. We all feel blue. We all have struggles. We all have ups and downs. But if you don't handle it well, or if you don't know what's going on, or if you think it's abnormal or something's wrong with you, a very normal kind of depression can grow into something much worse. So with that, let's first um, define what depression is. Uh, depression is a state or feeling of being sad or dejected. It's a mental disorder marked by inactivity. You're not motivated when you're depressed. Feelings of hopelessness, loss of motivation, and a loss of sense of one's own worth. Uh, and as you do that, what I want to do is, you'll notice on your notes, um, it says normal depression. Depression's not always bad. Imagine, if you will, if you've ever sprained your ankle badly and they put one of those air casts on it, and they, maybe it's some ligaments and they're not sure what's happened, and they blow it up and they put it, and what it does is it immobilizes your leg or your arm. Depression does that for us. There's certain normal things that happen in our lives, like the death of a child or the death of a spouse or a, a, a trauma or a tragedy, that literally God has our emotions in such a way that it, it's like an air cast, and it begins to immobilize us so we can have time to process and work through things. Here's some very common normal times when all of us will tend to get depressed. The death of a spouse the death of an immediate family member, a divorce or separation in your marriage, the divorce or separation of your parents, uh, moving to a new location, even if it's a good move, an addition to your family, uh, a family member who moves away or moves out from home, sort of that empty nest moment, um, complete a major goal like graduation. Sometimes you get depressed because you've worked and worked and worked and worked and <gasps> you finally get there and then there's this huge letdown. The loss of a job or getting a new job, uh, financial difficulties, uh, the purchase or the sale of a home. I mean, one might be good, the other might be bad, but both can bring depression. Uh, miscarriage or an abortion, uh, the birth of a baby. I think it's about one out of eight or nine women have severe, I mean, it goes into clinical depression of postpartum depression after having a child. Long, extreme work hours, pressures and deadlines that you're racing to meet. Now, Everybody's going to experience some of those sometime. And you're normally going to feel blue 
and discouraged and sad and have little windows of time that feel like I feel hopeless and the future doesn't look bright. I don't think anything will ever work out. My family's a mess or I'm a mess or my finances are a mess or the future can never be good. This happened to my parents or I've lost something or someone. Those are times where sort of that air cast of depression is going to come upon your life and mine. And what God wants us to understand is There's ways to respond to that and ways not to respond to that. And some are good and some are very bad. Sometimes depression is not just from events or circumstance, but there's actually physiological or physical factors. Extreme fatigue. If you go and go and go and go, don't get much sleep. High, super high stress over a long period of time. Uh, Certain kinds of medication. I had a very close friend, a mentor who was just one of the most godly men I ever knew. And uh, he had uh, genetic super high blood pressure and had to take a blood pressure medication that he fought depression all of his life. And uh, I'll share one of the things that he did that helped him uh, work through that. Uh, Endocrine imbalance or electrolyte imbalance. I remember uh, being on a team with Glenn Miller. And uh, we were playing in the Philippines. It was super hot. We played multiple games. Uh, He got dehydrated, then electrolyte imbalance. Uh, literally came this close to dying. We put him in an ambulance and they put IVs, but his whole electrolytes went off. And I remember all the way flying back, he was lying on the floor, a special place on the plane. He was having panic attacks. And when he got back for weeks and weeks, he, he struggled with panic attacks and depression that he never had in his life until the electrolytes in his system So there's physical things that bring about depression, and they're very hard. Uh, Diet, low blood sugar or hypoglycemia, viral infections, uh, hormonal changes, typically at puberty. This is parents. You've got to be very aware of what's happening when your son or daughters are going through puberty, and you see some, you know, mood changes, Um, postpartum menopause, uh, underactive thyroid. Uh, That's one that... uh, Often, it's amazing, you'll see someone whose thyroid is underactive, uh, it gets addressed, and they'll think like, oh my, you mean the whole, everyone looks at life like this? Because they've learned to live with sort of this low-grade sense of life is dark and hard and sad and difficult. Uh, Brain injuries, uh, addictions, or the use of mood-altering drugs or alcohol. So those, those those are a lot of physical factors. You can see why it's so widespread in America. Now, here's one thing I want to just, in your notes, it says clinical depression. Clinical depression is when some combination of those things, it might be normal, that might be physical. I'm going to go over some psychological and spiritual issues with depression. Here's what you need to understand. Depression is complex. It's rarely just an event or just emotional or just physical or just spiritual. Usually, there's a combination of things. In fact, when you see how God deals with different people in the Bible when they're depressed, there's no one size fits all. When Elijah is depressed, he's come off this mountaintop experience. He's completely depleted, and God says, here's what you need. You're going to just lay low and sleep and get some good food. David gets depressed because he sinned, right? Psalm 32, what he needed was confronted in confession. Jonah, God speaks to him, and he literally rebukes him, and, hey, you need to get perspective, So it's a very complex thing when you get depressed. It can't be one size fits all. Well, you did that, and then you always ought to do this. Here's, put a little asterisk in your notes on clinical depression. When you get depressed at a very significant level, and some changes happen in your brain, this is what we call clinical depression, physical factors, the serotonin, the neoprenephrine, the chemicals in your brain that causes your synapse to work, if you get so depressed that those things start not working, it's called clinical depression, and you start looking at life like this. No amount of praying, no amount of Bible verses, no amount of counseling or people saying everything's going to be okay. Literally, your perspective is completely tilted. This is when people that you know and you love and you can't understand and someone commits suicide. This can happen to a teenager, a housewife, after a baby. You need to understand is that people look at life like this and and, and problems that are this big feel this big. And everything is dark. It's so dark and they can't get out of it themselves. Clinical depression. Now, can God intervene and miraculously do something? Well, he can do that in a broken bone as well. But usually you have to get a broken bone set. And in most clinical depression, you need medical help 
often need to get on antidepressants for at least some season. And until your brain is functioning, you can't comprehend what God is saying through his word and prayer and good counseling. Does that make sense? What I don't want you to hear, because we're going to walk through a passage, this is God's plan for the normal, I call it the gray funk. To me, it's like, we, I used to live over on the coast, and you'd see the fog coming in, and then it would just sort of settle. And, and sometimes you can almost feel depression coming on. Like, and there's something weird about it. As it comes, I feel kind of down, feel kind of hopeless, feel kind of bummed out. And there's almost part of you like, I think I'll just sit here and get depressed. And then it goes, ugh. And then pretty soon you try and pray, you try to talk, you try to do something positive. You have negative thoughts. You think negatively about other people. There's no motivation. And then you go on this very bad downward spiral. So what you need to understand is clinical depression, when you get where you start having some really, really bad thoughts, this is why we're going to talk about where you go, who you communicate with. But most of us are going to have the common cold kind of depression multiple times in our life for some of us, a few times each month. Uh, some people struggle with depression a lot more than others. Some of it's literally genetic. There's, there's whole lines of people that are going to have difficulty with depression. And what, as Christians, what we need to understand is that, that's no different than having genetic or some issue in some other area. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or you're unspiritual to be depressed. Now, let me give you some psychological factors and then some spiritual factors. And then what I want to do is really turn the page and say, okay, for all of us, mostly normal depression issues, what's God's solution? Because what you're going to see is the Bible's so relevant. God has hope for us when we feel dark and discouraged. So physical factors uh, uh, we talked about. Now psychological factors, a major loss in your life, both re either real or perceived. Uh, anger that is turned inward. Just, you, you might just jot a note. 95% of psychological depression is anger turned inward. You're mad, you're frustrated, and, and you stuff it. Uh, guilt, real or imagined. A major transition from, you know, like adolescence or midlife, emptiness, retirement, just any kind of major loss, grief. It could be the loss of a dream, loss of a job. In any major loss, when you start having grief psychologically, it can cause you to get depressed. Faulty or negative thinking. Some of us have been trained by family of origin to think negatively about everything. I mean, the cup isn't even half full for some of you. Uh, being around negative people, that's a good one, isn't it? I mean, we're all around some negative people sometimes, but if that's your only, if that's all that you're around all the time, it can be very discouraging, very depressing. A low self-esteem, unrealistic expectations, or just self-pity. Th those are all very common psychological factors. Spiritually, there's other factors. Spiritual exhaustion after successful ministry. Sometimes you bust it and bust it and bust it and bust it, and God did great things, and for reasons you can't understand, you are so bummed out afterwards. A spiritual attack. Uh, this is a part of my history. I, it took me quite a while to figure it out. Uh, it doesn't happen near as much anymore, but I would have like for years, about Saturday, I've always taught a Saturday night service, about one o'clock of just kind of fine-tuning, getting ready to go to church, and I'd be walking in the light, and it's literally like whew, a sheet would come down on Saturday at one o'clock. And it wasn't like I was discouraged. It was like life I'm the worst pastor in the world. I'm the worst man in the world. I'm the worst father in the world. I have nothing to say. Everything that I study is meaningless. And I would have this window of time that I'd just be like, oh, my lands. And I didn't realize it was spiritual opposition. And so my response when I started to do spiritual warfare, I watched God break that. So discerning, is it physical or is it spiritual? Is, is, it, is it you just been going too hard? Could it be spiritual attack? Uh, another other, a wrong perspective or self-effort. And what I mean by that is trying to do God's will in the energy of the flesh. Trying, to, trying so hard to do what God wants you to do, but not trusting God, not being empowered by the Spirit. Uh, a, a spiritual disappointment. I mean, there's times where we really think, God, this is what you want, this is what you want. And you go, that? Like Jeremiah, and he's just super discouraged. Uh, spiritual confusion. I mean, there's times where you're praying and seeking, and it's like, God, what is going on? And can get really discouraged and depressed. A rebellion like Saul. Saul had major mental problems because he rebelled against God. Remember, he would have David come and play music, and it would help kind of ease the depression. 
Well, he was in a state of rebellion. God said, do this. He said, I'm doing that. When you're going the opposite direction that you know is God's will, don't be surprised if you don't get depressed. Unresolved resentment and bitterness, and probably the biggest one is uh, lack of forgiveness. There is just something amazing that happens when we do not forgive people and what that does to our soul and our psyche. Well, at the very bottom, here's the question. What do you do when you get depressed? I mean, just the normal, run-of-the-mill, feeling blue, feeling down, not very motivated, kind of sinking. I feel I'm depressed. It's not clinical. I'm not suicidal. But I'm bummed out. I'm not motivated. feel kind of hopeless. Not very excited about my marriage. Not excited about being single. Don't really like my job. You know, it's closing in, closing in, closing in. What do you do? Do you fake it? Do you deny it? Do you bury it? Do you kind of just break down? (laughs) You know? Do you blow up? Some people get really angry. Do you eat? Go shopping? Watch TV? Buy a toy? A push harder? I'm just going to power through this. Have an affair? Get a workout? Call your therapist? What do you do? Those are all very common options when people get depressed. Well, as you open your notes, and from the sound, it sounds like you're there and I'm not, is there's an answer here, and the answer is Psalm 77. And just a little bit of context, this is a very godly man writing this. Uh, he's, he wrote only a few psalms. It's during the time of David when David is king, and worship was awesome. I mean, awesome. David was a musician, and worship was great in Israel. This was the worship leader. Now, he didn't have an Australian accent, but he was the worship leader. And, and like all people in life and all people in ministry, you know, something happened. We don't get the background, but something happened in his life where he's discouraged, and his discourage goes beyond depression. And, and what I've done is I've taken it, and I've studied the psalm, and then I've laid it out, And I believe there's very clearly about six life lessons from Psalm 77. First of all, let's look at this song of comfort. This is the dark night of the soul. You are bummed out. What do you do? What does he do? Verse 1, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord at night. I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and I groaned and I mused and my spirit grew faint. Lesson number one, when you get discouraged and depressed, cry out to God. That's the first thing. It's so easy to do something else like watch TV or go eat or go shopping. See, when when depressive feelings come, we have responses, and we get into patterns. Negative responses cause a downward spiral. Positive responses help us begin to deal with it in a good way. Just notice what he said. Notice verse 1. I cried out. I cried out. I sought the Lord. I stretched out untiring hands. He's a worship leader. Life is dark. He's super bummed out, but where is he going? By the way, he doesn't feel like it. Okay, he doesn't feel like it. But he goes to God, and and literally, he cries out. This isn't like, God, I'm really having a bad day, and I would really like your help. This word is, he's crying out loud. He's saying, God, help me. I'm I'm struggling. By the way, jot down, if you would, very interesting passage, Hebrews 5, 7. Speaks of Jesus. It's one of those times where we get a wind tone into Jesus' lives. It says, in the days, plural, of Jesus on earth, he cried out to God, cried out with loud crying and tears. So in the days, in other words, not on a day, Jesus was fully God, but he was fully human. And in his humanness, he had disappointment and grief and betrayal and struggle and fatigue and stress. And when he felt overwhelmed and he had the dark night of the soul, he was tempted in every way like us, and depression was one of those. And and he would go to a lonely place by himself, and he would verbally, out loud, cry out to the Lord, and he would share his emotions, and it says, in, in loud cries and tears. 
Something happens when you get it out and you bring it to God. When you start feeling low, that's the first and maybe the most important step. He, he's in distress. He's not comforted. Notice the symptoms. He's sleepless, confused, despair, discouraged, and depressed. The second stanza, he goes on. You kept my eyes from closing. In fact, he's actually, he's blaming God at this point. Anybody else do that? You kept my, I can't sleep. I was too troubled to speak. Well, why? Well, could have been circumstances, could have been this, could have been that. But he's too troubled. Trouble, and it's God's fault. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. he's, He's looking backwards and going, wow, it used to be great. And man, it's not great now. My heart mused and my spirit inquired. You know what he does? There's a little shift here. Recall past blessings in verses 4 through 6. First, he he blames God because I can't sleep. You know, he's thinking of one of those psalms that God gives to his beloved sleep. God cares for us. He gives us rest. What about all those promises of peace? He goes, I can't sleep. He says, I remember... I remember great times with you. I remember intimate times with you. I remember when I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would have this intimate, close time with you. And he's a worship leader, so he probably sang. And he's thinking, that was then and this is now. And then he says, what's he say? He says, my heart mused, I thought, and I inquired. And so he's beginning a little process to deal with his depression. He uh, ponders the struggle And then as he ponders, he does something that most of us don't feel the freedom to do. He asks God the hard questions. See, sometimes when life's not going well and people let you down and you feel betrayed and as far as you know, you did exactly what God wanted you to do and the sale fell through. You did exactly what you were supposed to do and that person walked out on you. You did exactly what you were supposed to do and you were honest and you didn't. There's times where You know, this is totally unfair. Where are you, God? Where are your promises? Where's your provision? Where's your protection? Because I've got all that in my head, and I've experienced it some over here, but my life right now, it's not working at all. And so notice, he asked God hard questions. There's six rhetorical questions beginning at verse 7. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again to His unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Now, just by way of knowing where this guy's at emotionally, why don't you get a pen out and underline the word reject and then underline the word show his favor and then put a box around never. (laughs) And then unfailing, vanished love, has it vanished? Promise failed, God forgotten, in anger withheld. I mean, this is a guy who has absolute despair and doubt. Rejected, vanished, promise failed, love. And then notice, how long does he think this is going to go on? When you're depressed, you lose perspective. So how long does he think this is going to happen as he's asking these questions? Notice in verse 7, reject forever. Put a box around forever. Put a box around never. Could he ever show his favor again? And and the question mark here is probably not. Or or has unfailing love vanished? Box around forever. Is his promise going to fail how long? All time. You, You get the idea? He asks God the hard questions, and his perspective is absolutely gone. He's hopeless. what, what what, What do you expect of God? God's unfailing love, right? That's why they call it unfailing. Slow to anger, abundant in compassion. His promises, his concern, his protection, his provision. I mean, this man has experienced this all his life, and now it's dark. It's so dark, it's not like there's even a light at the end of the tunnel that could be a train. I mean, it's just dark, dark, dark. And basically what he says to God is, is, is this it? 
And I want to suggest that that's one of the most healthy things you can ever do when your hope is lost. Ask hard questions. Now, by the way, um, when you're kids or when you're with a friend and they start saying some of these things, as a Christian, here's what we do sometimes dangerously. You know what? God didn't come through for me. I can't believe it. She walked out on me. You know what? I was faithful, and you know what? I didn't get the job, and man, this sucks. I just, this is terrible. I don't, you know what? That coach, they're all those people. You know, I think I'm going to, and, and what our temptation is, oh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Everything's going to be all right. When people are beginning to ask honest questions, what you need to say is, you know, I think we need to tell God that. Why don't you just tell him that right now? And then listen very carefully. And then watch for mood swings. I don't know all the history of what's happened above Seattle. But you know, a guy was a good student. He was on the homecoming court. Broke up with his girlfriend. Loss. Rejection. Hope gone. See, when we put our hope in, in people and we put our hope in things, we put our hope in teams, you know, in the video that we saw, Here's a guy that his whole world was sports, and then he gets cut from a team. You telling me he wasn't depressed? You telling me he didn't lose perspective? I mean, how do you go from a great family, a great experience, to shooting someone? See, we, we need to be very astute when people get depressed. Listen carefully. Really, really good people, okay? Really, really godly people do some very irrational things, either to themselves or with others. And so, as a parent, you want to be asking questions and not always trying to soothe everything and everything's okay. As a friend, when you start seeing some of this, now obviously, every time you get with them, if they're vetting about this and venting about that, and you know, you need to put up the stop sign and say, you know, you want help here or, but you need to be very, when people get to these places, And then when you watch if they start their behavior, they start to withdraw. You can kind of see it on their face. They're they're kind of have mood swings. Uh, Behaviors, if they they drink a little, they start drinking a lot. If if they begin to have escapism behavior and their eating patterns change, their sleeping patterns change, it's lots of video games. They don't show up for things. Now they don't seem to be very interested in spiritual things. All those are clues where we help our brothers and sisters or our kids. And what we need to do is make sure that those hard questions are ones that we say, hey, I I need to get those before God. God can handle those. I don't need to defend him. But we need to help people process because if they shove them down, really, really bad stuff happens. Now, verse 10, thank God that the psalm turns. I mean, it goes from it's not looking very good. And, and he does something. He chooses to redirect his thoughts. And the fourth lesson is choose to redirect your thoughts. Follow along in verse 10. Notice the word then. You might put like a little a triangle around then. Okay? I cried out to the Lord. There's no help. Life is terrible. I can't believe it. I can't sleep. It's your fault. I, I've kind of tried to recall some blessings and it's not doing very well. Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Did you notice that, number one, he's making a choice. Notice in the notes it says, choose to redirect your thoughts. You might go back through and, did you notice, I will, I will, I will, I will. Look at your notes, underline it each time. See, when you're depressed, you you come to this place and you're right at this crossroads. You're at this crossroads and you're either going to go down, dooby doo doo, down, 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 or you're going to make a choice And you're going to change your thinking. And then did you notice, I will remember, I will remember, I will remember, I will consider, I will meditate. 
All those are active thinking words. So he makes a choice, and he's going to think, he's going to remember. And what does he meditate and remember? What's it say? On miracles of the past. I'm going to make my case before the Most High. And then he uses this word, the Most High, El Elyon. It's a name for God that, God, you are the creator and you are the preserver and sustainer of all. And then later on, he talks about, I'll remember the works of the Lord. In your notes, it's capital L-O-R-D, right? When, whenever it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the translators are saying this is God's covenant game, Yahweh. The I am that I am. So something big is happening. He's making a choice. Not his circumstances, not his feelings. He's still in the dark, but he's going to choose to think, to remember, to meditate, to consider. And he's going to look on the facts, the miracles, where God's been faithful in the past. And as he thinks on God's acts, God's acts, God's acts, it will lead him to consider God's ways. Who are you, God? See, here's what depression does. It alters your perspective. You begin to think negatively. You begin to think unrealistically. You begin to think in a way that is unbiblical and untrue. But when you begin to think negatively, unbiblically, and untrue, then you begin to look at yourself differently. You look at others differently. Then your actions will follow. Uh, I uh, just did a a little eight-day teaching that I had signed up for about a year ago. And you never know how this part of your life and the new parts of your life intertwine. And so uh, I'd been teaching seven weeks in a row here. And uh, then I uh, needed to be in Dallas Seminary, had their 90th anniversary. It was a real honor and a privilege. And I got to speak at that. And there was a meeting the night before, a lunch before that. And, and then I went to Atlanta. And uh, so I flew again, another time frame. And then I had a dinner and spoke that night and then interacted with people, then got up and spoke two more times that morning and interacted with people. Had a little break on Saturday, and I, I felt myself getting depressed, so I went down and got a, a workout, and I just, I just didn't want to, just force myself to do that. I traveled on Monday, then I made myself, so it was Dallas, Atlanta, then New York, and about 450 pastors showed up that were just some of the most wonderful guys I'd ever been around. And so I taught for an hour, three different times, and then Q&A with pastors in between each time. Had just enough time to come back and finish up my notes that I emailed back so I would be ready. And then that night, about 1,500 people showed up. And it's a place where we've been on the air for about 15 years, just really warm people. So uh, I was tired, so I spoke for an hour instead of 45 minutes. But they were very patient. And then afterwards, people lined up for an hour and a half to tell their stories. And then I got on a plane and flew all day from Elmira to Detroit, from Detroit to Atlanta, got on a plane at 8 o'clock in Atlanta, and East Coast time got in about 2 a.m. on Wednesday night. Well, then I'd been out, so then I had meetings all day Thursday to get all caught up. Well, guess what happened on Friday? I was depressed. (laughs) And it's not, I don't think this was God saying, you really need to get this afresh so that you'll know how to really communicate this. But I was, I was just, I mean, everything I just said now, it was sort of like gray, bluish funk. It wasn't the absolute dark kind. I've got various levels of depression. I don't get depressed very often, but when I do, I only, I go. I'm a pretty optimistic person. We all have different personality types and backgrounds, and I'm up in general. But when I get fatigued, when I go down, I know, realize I get about here, and when I get here, it can go like South Pole deep very quickly. And um, Teresa is always very encouraging. And so I was very moody and not very fun to be around. And and I thought, well, maybe I'll try and go get a workout because I couldn't stand to be living with me. And and so I walked out and and she said something very kindly. This is, you got to have truth people. She goes, well, you know, because of your travel and I was helping the grandkids you know, we really haven't seen each other that much, and this is kind of a bummer a day because this is our day. To which I thought, absolutely. And uh, I walked out, ready to get a workout, and I got just, I have a little bench in front of my house. So I sat on the bench, and the sun was down, or you know, coming, and um, sometimes the sunlight helps. I try every trick I know. And I just was like, everything in me was like, I just, I, I don't care. 
I don't care. I don't want to preach. I don't want to talk. I don't want to be around anyone. You know, all, I'm, I'm recognizing all these things. I'm, I'm living in them. And, and then in the back of my mind, I just thought, I'm also being so self-centered and so selfish. And I, what, what a way to treat my wife after being not around for seven or eight days. And as I sat there on the bench, it was literally, I just came to this. You, you know those crossroads in your mind? And, and the Spirit of God was not very loud. You know, sometimes how it's, well, God spoke to me. Well, sometimes it's God whispers. And when I'm really starting to get depressed, I, his voice gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And I just heard this little whisper. You got a choice to make. You can choose to remember. You can choose to give thanks. You can choose to bank on what's actually true. Or, I mean, you're on your way down and it doesn't look good. The rest of this day, you've treated your wife this way. You've not been very... And as I sat on the bench, I literally just said, okay. And I started with my kids. God, thank you for Annie. God, thank you for Jason. Thank you for Eric. Uh, Thank you for Ryan. Then I went through through all my grandkids. Then I prayed for every elder. Then I prayed for every staff member. Then I thought of anything good that has happened last seven or eight or ten days. Then I thought about you. And I just thank God, 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 thank God. Until I couldn't think of anything to thank him. And you know what happened? the iceberg of depression started to melt a little bit. And then I realized it's not just thinking, i got to do something. So I went back in, and I, I, this was my big joke. I said, honey, my workout was great. I was only out there like 15 minutes, you know. And she goes, that wasn't very long. I said, yeah, it was a super duper one. Do you want to go grab a cup of coffee, and I'll run that errand with you? We had to take the dog to a doctor or something. And she just, yes. The whole rest of our day was really good, very refreshing. Here's what you got to understand. Crossroads. Crossroads. You cry out to God. And after you cry out to God, then you have to recall past blessings. And then you ask God hard questions. You choose to redirect your thoughts. You just choose to. And it doesn't feel like it. I'm going to give you some very practical ways in a minute. And then fifth, magnify God to diminish your problems. See, if you begin, here's what happened. I started thanking him for these people. And I thought, wow, wow. Wow, wow. And then I actually went and I thought, wow, you know what? I was so nervous about that thing at Dallas Seminary and I was really intimidated doing it. Thank you, that went well. And I met with those people and then I started rehearsing those stories that some of those pastors told me. And I thought, who am I to get to be involved in this? Well, my thinking started changing. And then what happened is pretty soon my, my view of God. God's not distant. He loves me. He's for me. He cares about me. I mean, my wife wants to be around me and I, you know, I've been a not not very nice person to be around. She cares about, who am I to have kids like this and grandkids like this and to get to minister with people like you all? And all of a sudden, that crossroads, pretty soon, reciting God's acts, his miracles, what he's done, you get a different view of God. Notice what the psalmist does here, beginning in verse 13. He now goes from his acts, he's meditated on the miracles. He goes, your ways, O God, are holy. Can you you feel the difference? What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people from the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, speaking of the Red Sea, he's going back. This is what they always do when they get really discouraged. They always go back to that defining moment, out of Egypt, Red Sea. And the picture that he uses, he goes, the waters, literally, the Red Sea saw you, O God. They saw you and they, they withered from the very depths and were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. This is a picture of He's going to go to the Red Sea, and out of the Red Sea, what he's bringing to mind is Sinai. Remember when God gave the Ten Commandments, and it began to shake, and there were peals of thunder, and then there was lightning, and all the people, were, and it was like, and he's going back and going, that's the God I serve. I'm not going to have a pity party. This is the God who does the impossible, the miraculous. This is the God who has great acts, but gives great words and promises of hope, and I'm a part of that. He goes on to say, your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Considering and remember God acts leads. Notice what your ways are holy, totally set apart. It's a formidable word in this context. It refers to coming before the God 
who is unapproachable light. And as a foe, unbelievably intimidating. And as a friend, unbelievably comforting. Your ways are holy. They're set apart. They're pure. They're good. And then notice his ways are not only holy, they're powerful. You got power. I'm not inept. I'm not stuck. There's not any way out. There was the Red Sea, and then there was that army. And he's going to start reciting in his mind and in his heart all the miracles, all the miracles, all the miracles, all the miracles. And pretty soon his God gets big again. And not only is he powerful, but he's tender, he's caring. Notice he says, you're the redeemer. It's a Hebrew word that means you have to be a, a part of a kinsman redeemer. There has to be a relationship. And what he's saying is, your tender-hearted relationship, holy and awesome, the creator, you speak the galaxies into existence in this great power that can do and overcome any impossible situation, and yet you're this tender God who would buy back and redeem his people like a shepherd and put them over his shoulders and care for them and love them. All of a sudden, he has a caring, loving, powerful, holy God. Because here's the deal. When you magnify God, here's what happens to my problems. And on that park bench right in front of our house, they were right about here. And no matter what I looked at, bummer, bummer, dark, dark, gray. And then I prayed, and then I thanked, and then I prayed, and then I thanked, and then I thanked, 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 and then I remembered. And pretty soon there was a big oak tree and there was sun and there was light and there were promises and there were children and there were grandchildren and there were blessings and there were people and there were staff members and there were elders and there were past history. And all of a sudden, you know, that that didn't go away. I still had to fight. But big God, small problems. Big problems, small God. It's a lot of work. The final thing that happens is he... He trusts God for future deliverance. When he started out, he's crying out. He can't sleep. He's bummed out. It's probably God's fault. And now, notice what he says. Your path. Now now he's looking at the, the relationship. Your path led through the sea, not around it. Your path led through the impossible position. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock. By the hand of Moses and Aaron, God's former path, his way, his holiness through an impossible situation in the past. And notice how did he do it? He did it mysteriously. He said, your footprints weren't seen. You did it. And and then notice how he did it. He said, "You, you shepherd us like a flock and you use people. At times you intervened in amazing, miraculous ways, but you shepherded us, you loved us through Moses and Aaron. And could I remind you that God will deliver you, but the, the way he'll deliver most of us most of the time is through another caring person. And that's why you can't keep this stuff inside. You go to God first. So let's do a quick review. You cry out to God. You recall past blessings. You ask God the hard questions. You choose to redirect your thoughts. You magnify God to diminish your problems, and then you trust God to be your deliverer. What he did in the past, he'll do in the future. In fact, I, I have a, a little, uh, I have a sheet of paper on it. I, I, write per, I wrote perspective, and then I just, I just listed 10 things that whenever I get really, really discouraged or depressed, and that God did in our journey. They're sort of like the big mile markers. And, you know, number one, we didn't have any food, didn't have any money, five bags of groceries landed, yet we told no one. I couldn't get a credit card, and I knew the bank president personally. (laughs) That was in the early, early days. And and, uh, God allowed us to buy a house. Uh, Then I got a $1,000 check from a football quarterback when we were out of money and couldn't pay our rent. Green Bay Packers, go Aaron Rodgers. It wasn't him, but it was an earlier quarterback. Um, we, finding a home, uh, we made it through cancer. I had a son on, the, on a table with appendicitis and it was bursting and they said, you know, we got to operate right now. Let us check one more time. And I remember being in there with Teresa, laying our hands on him and praying for him. And they came back and, you know, what? we don't know what happened. We don't need to do surgery. Um, supernaturally delivering 
one of my kids that was far from God came back around. Um, my salvation, I go back to being in that auditorium and being far from God and, and hearing the Lord's prayer sung and understanding the gospel and Revelations 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, if any person would open the door of your heart, I will come into him and I'll sup with him. I'll love you, I'll forgive you. And then I look back on 30 plus years and I think, oh God, where would I be? Yes, I'm bummed out today. Yes, I've lost perspective. Yes, I wasn't a very good husband. Yes, I'm moody right now. But oh God, where would I be? Are you getting the idea? Turn to the back page. I want to give you something really, really practical to walk away with. I want you to do, this is an action plan to overcome depression. And and as you see this, number one, examine your thinking, okay? This is where you start. I was sitting on that bench realizing, how am I thinking? Answer, not good. Do you recognize that it's normal to feel depressed now and then? Some of you, you just turn on the guilt meter. I'm depressed. I'm a terrible person. No, you're depressed, okay? Second, is your focus on the pressure and problems you're experiencing or on your response to those pressures and problems? It sounds subtle, but it's a big difference. If you keep focus on the problem, the problem, the problem, it grows, it grows, it grows. Stop and focus. What's my response? I got to think differently. I choose to think. What's my response? Second, examine your behavior. Are you choosing positive or negative responses to your depression? Some positive responses, you get busy. You go get a workout. You go help someone else. You stop introspecting. You go take a walk. You write a letter. You act. Don't sit around when you're depressed. Don't eat when you're depressed. Don't sit in front of a TV and watch movies when you're depressed. You'll go from a level 5 depressing to a level 9 to a 10. Pray, get in God's word, put in a teaching CD or MP3, put on positive, encouraging music. You just, you gotta, you gotta fight. You gotta break out of the the fog and the blue and the down. Negative responses, eating, TV, shop, self-talk, I'm a terrible person, sinking, sleeping, illicit sex, porn, daydreaming, escapism behavior, suicide. You just you got to ask your, my behavior. Have you willfully stopped to recall God's blessings in your past? And this sounds hokey, but I'm telling you it works. Pull out pictures of your family, pictures of your wedding, slides, albums, old videos. Pull out an old journal. Read when you were close to God. I have a napkin exercise when I'm not around and I feel it coming on, I get a napkin, stop at a coffee shop, and I list as many things on one side of a napkin, blessing, 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 flip it over, and keep writing. And all all I do, all it does is, all it's just, wait a second. My perspective isn't true, but my mind and my heart don't feel that. And then finally, examine your future. Can the God who did so much in your past handle what you're facing today? I mean, that's logical, right? I mean, do you remember when you were in your marriage? Do you remember when one of your kids were? Do you remember when you thought you'd never get married? Do you remember when you had that illness? Remember when you had cancer? Remember when you went belly up financially and, 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 right? You got a history. You think the God that took care of that one can take care of the next one? It's not hopeless. It's not dark. It just feels that way. Finally, is there a specific positive step you could take to thank God or to help someone else in order to demonstrate your confidence in God's love. See, it, it gets back to faith. See, so actually, here's, here's what happens. What actually happens is, I remember uh, Carl Menninger, the great psychologist, there was a guy that was clinically depressed. They gave him medicine. They did shock treatment. Nothing worked, nothing worked, nothing worked. And he just wanted to die. And finally said, we have an emergency here. A guy came in to him. He goes, a guy two doors down, he's going to die. And he's going to die here in about three days. I have no one available. Would you please just... Be, be with him. Just take five minutes of your time. Oh, I can't. I'm not worth Oh, you don't have to be worth anything. I just need a body. Got the guy to go three doors down in the hospital and sat next to a guy who was dying. When he began to care and think about someone else, bam, depression lifted. It's one of the greatest things you can do. Get depressed. Man, I'm going to help somebody. I could be dangerous right now. I'm really going to help somebody. It's a battle that we all face. That God wants you to find him in the midst of that.